20 years ago, the United States invaded Iraq. But as Saddam Hussein's regime fell, and the U.S. declared victory, major combat operations in Iraq have ended. A violent insurgency was taking root across the country. I felt like we had pried the doors off a mental institution. I mean, what we didn't realize was the invasion wasn't the war. The war was to come. American forces would go on to confront the insurgents in what became the bloodiest battle of the war. When it felt like we were surrounded, there were shots coming from everywhere. Told by the Marines, journalists, and Iraqis who were there. The Target! Once upon a time in Iraq, Fallujah. This program contains graphic imagery of war, which may not be suitable for all audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. By the time I got to Fallujah, you know, I thought I'd seen it all. I thought I'd survived it all. Are you right? <laughs> no. No, I mean, God, no. Um, no. No, that was a whole different level of, of violence. Fallujah is 35 miles from Baghdad, and by the spring of 2004, it was completely in the hands of uh, the insurgents and Al Qaeda, and it had become like a giant car bomb factory. They were just like making car bombs and like shipping them to Baghdad, you know, like every day. The story of Fallujah begins with four Blackwater contractors who were, you know, driving around Fallujah and they got ambushed. The Iraqis gather around and just like having a party. and they picked up what was left of their bodies. And then they take them up to the bridge on the Euphrates and, you know, string them up. It was like on television, beamed around the world, and the Iraqis are partying and they love it and they're making fools out of the Americans and they're hitting them with their shoes. And that was like, you know, that was like the end, you know? I mean, it was, what a, what a friggin' nightmare. our country shows any uncertainty or weakness in this decade, the world will drift toward tragedy. This is not going to happen on my watch. It was November 2004. Bush won the election. I almost immediately gave the order. Send the Marines into Fallujah and like occupy Fallujah and destroy the insurgency. Civilians mostly cleared out. I mean, certainly from what I witnessed, it's very strange because usually when an army attacks, it wants to have surprise. Um, you're not going to announce when the attack begins. Well, the Americans essentially did that. They were like, on the bullhorns, we are going to attack. The city will not be safe. There's a good chance he will die if you stay.
الناس كلها طلعت فلوس عدها احنا ما عدنا اي شيء اللي يطلع يريد كروه سيارة يريد بيت يقعد بيه اللي عنده قرايبة الراحة لي احنا صعبة يعني نتكون فوق الناس قلنا نقعد عليك يا الله مصطفى شو أقول لك علي منسنا هو يعني الأول بك البكر لي مصطفى كان يعني هو الحياة الحلوة لي عمره سنتين إلا شهر يشوف جيارنا عندهم باسكلات قام يطلع بالشارع يقول له ماما يريد بايسكل هو أنا يعني حالتنا ما تسمح أن أشتري له بايسكل أقول شو وقت يكبر يصير شاب يقوم يشتغل لي يطب علي يروح للسوق ما صارت Billy was born on November the 24th, 1981. He just he sort of popped out. I was in labor for 53 painful hours with Sabrina. So this, this one was like a cakewalk. I was excited. He was excited because it was a boy. <laughs> Man always wants a boy. Carry on the namesake. I say he's mom's favorite. She'll say no, but he was. He was very outgoing, very busy. He always looked for adventure. He was always pushing his limits. He definitely wasn't college material. You know, he struggled in school and that would have been good for him, you know, to go into the Marines. Miller was a great guy. He was someone that can talk to you, you know, without the typical Marine yelling and calling you an idiot, you know. You know, I was really scrawny. I was 130 pounds, and I thought that I was just going to become tough. I was one of the first people from my high school to join the Marine Corps, and it was really great. I was proud of the fact that this is what he wanted to do. I was also very scared. When he joined, it was just a peaceful little world. It wasn't a peaceful little world anymore. So yep. just over a week after 9-11 when he, when he graduated from boot camp. After he graduated and he left us, he went to Spain. He came home December 2003, and we surprised my parents. Is Billy in that box? No. Let me and Billy got your protection. And I said, is Billy in that box? She said, no, mother. I says, did y'all buy me a dog or some animal? Because I don't want any animals. No, mother, we didn't buy you any animals. But you need to open it up now. It was probably her best Christmas ever and her last Christmas. With them. At that time, 1st Battalion, 8th Marines took over an area called Camp Fallujah. It was probably three miles outside the city. Billy Miller was in the 1st Battalion, 8th Marines with us. And Dexter Filkins reported to my platoon also. I remember thinking, why are the New York Times here? But it's an indicator something big was happening. From a journalistic point of view, war is kind of the, the human condition in extremis. People have asked me before, like, were you addicted to the violence or were you addicted to the adrenaline? And like, it's like, no, um, not at all. 
you know, I just wanted to help other people understand what was happening so that they could make decisions about it. Was there a time when you thought you had pushed it too far? Definitely. Um, more than once. I felt that in Fallujah. I definitely felt that in Fallujah. There was another reporter with him. His name was Ashley Gilbertson. Ashley's like a kid. He was like so young, but he's immensely talented and uh, really fearless and very enterprising. So, uh, you know, we got along really well. Working with Dexter was amazing. There was almost nowhere that he wouldn't go, and the same went for me. No journalist likes to embed with military. It's too confining. You know, imagine you're walking through an Iraqi village, and you're, you know, I'm a journalist. I'm, I want to know what's going on inside people's heads, in their hearts. Like, what are you feeling over there, um, you Iraqis? Um, and it, you're standing with a group of 19-year-old Americans with giant guns, um, and you ask an Iraqi guy, hey, you know, how's it going? You're not going to get a real answer. But what happened in Iraq was it became essentially impossible to work unless you embedded with the military for the simple reason that you would get killed. If you could picture young buck warriors, we're very tribal. And anybody who's not in our tribe is basically the enemy as far as we're concerned, you know, just to varying degrees. Sure enough, when the press starts showing up, we didn't like them. Turns out they're sleeping in our squad bay with us. And when I first saw Ashley, he had one of those sleep things that covers your eyes, like a sleep mask. He's got long curly hair. I was just like, really? <laughs> you know, what is this guy? Why is he even here? And you see Dexter. Dexter looks like a frat boy who just woke up from the biggest party ever. You know, he's <laughs> just kind of this blown away look on his face all the time. So we were all just like super judgy and like, you know, oh, look at these guys, you know, I'm not talking to them. And you see right here, I'm standing on a train model of our battle space. Whenever like something changes or there's gonna be like a significant operation, the military gets a briefing from a legal officer who will tell you essentially, here are your rules of engagement, which is to say, here's when you can pull the trigger. Um, here's when you can't. And I had never been invited into one of those. I think they brought us in because they thought we're gonna be killing a lot of people, so we're gonna want the reporters uh, to kind of understand what the rules are here. So normally rules of engagement would be don't shoot unless you're being shot at. It's a general conflict rule of engagement. These ones were really different. The rules were like dialed really far back, like really loose, you know? Guy picks up a cell phone, you can kill him. If you know you fire like one warning shot at a car, if it doesn't if it doesn't stop coming at you, you can kill. You were able to engage anybody within the city because we were, we had instructed civilians to get out of the city. As long as you felt there was a threat, you can engage. Hey, Devil Dallas, how you doing? <laughs> how you doing, soldiers? <laughs> how you doing, sailors? <laughs> This is a whole can of whoop butt, all combined, okay? And I'm gonna tell you one thing, it is an honor for me to be able to serve with each and every one of you hard charges. I mean, I look out here and it's no difference than when we took the damn war over in Korea. We raised the flag at Iwo Jima, it's no difference. I'll go to Fallujah right now after hearing that speech. I mean, this stuff was, uh, it was motivating but it's disheartening at the same time looking at it now. And you know, one part they don't show is oftentimes they start off with the speech and saying, I want you to look to your brothers from you know, the left and the right and behind you and realize that some of them aren't gonna make it out of there. And you don't really look, right? Like it's part of a speech and you're just sitting there like, okay, yeah, we get it. And I just watched that video now and I can point out everyone that was killed. And they were almost in every clip. Kick some butt, all right? Yes. Yes. You're always worried about your child, but knowing that he's in a war zone is a different kind of worry, but it's not a worry that 
you can, at least I couldn't allow myself to overwhelm me. Being a police officer for 32 years, you have to live every day at a time as you live it. And you can't worry about it. If you worry yourself, it'll just worry you sick. The order had come down to attack. The troop carrier's doors opened. We all got out. And as we were assembling, they opened fire. It was just like a symphony. And then the, the, the voices came over from the mosques, which, which were in Arabic, come to the fight, you know, come defend the city. And there were so many mosques and so many loudspeakers, the intensity of their voices, they were screaming into the loudspeakers. Um, God is great, God is great, like come to the fight. Um, they're here, the Americans are here. I could see the tracers coming out. Okay, they're shooting at us, just kind of spraying machine gun fire at us. You know, and it felt a lot like, I don't know if you've ever seen Star Wars, where they're attacking the Death Star, where they're flying through this trench and there's like laser guns just shooting at them all over the place. It never looks or feels like what you imagine. But in this case, it looked remarkably like a movie. I was on the ground and I was kind of looking up and I thought, you know, that looks like uh, a bottle rocket. You know, it looks like a fireworks from 4th of July. <laughs> and then from out of nowhere, we hear these pops above our head. And you look up and it's these shells that have exploded and it's, a, it's like an octopus and tentacles coming down from the sky. This bright white light with a trail on it, like a comet, comes sailing in and then it explodes right above us. And, and these flaming sort of chunks of rock were coming off. And, and they were, people were just scrambling and like trying not to get hit. And, and you know, what the hell is that? I got hit in the back in my pack, and it just burned right through my pack. Uh, it burned through my sleeping bag. As I learned later, it was phosphorus, white phosphorus, and those are our, meaning American rounds. I mean, th those were fired by American guys. Like, at what, for what, uh, at whom, like, I got no idea. We go from there, still on this road, like 200 meters into Fallujah. We're right on the edge of the city. And it's, it's a big city. And then they get to this road that they called Phase Line Cathy. And it's this big east-west road that crosses Fallujah. And just to get to that road, it took them all morning. Hours and hours of fighting. Like every step of the way, they had to fight. Spread out, squallers, spread them out! Like you're running down the street and you can hear the bullets ricocheting around you, like bouncing off the street, coming off the concrete. And then it stops. And you, you get up to this area that the, the fire was coming from and there's the Marine Scout team up there and three dead insurgents on the road. first house we cleared was a little bit of chaos, a lot of adrenaline rushing. Fortunately, there was no insurgents in that house, but it wasn't exactly how we planned. There was a lot of people in there. We were congested, and it's not how we do things. But we wanted to make entry, and in Fallujah, the safest place you can be is inside a cleared house. And now we're in this house on a corner, and they had to cross this road to get to the cultural, what they were calling the cultural center, this big, like, five-story, four-story building on the other side of the street. And so, 
one of the lieutenants stands at the gate and says, all right, go. First platoon, go. And these 40 guys, like, stacked, stream out and just run across this street. And then it begins. All of this gunfire starts. A guy falls on the street. Second platoon goes out. Some guys drag this guy out of the street. Um, and another guy gets dropped. And then I'm with this last platoon sitting in the house. And I remember saying to Dexter, like, I really, I don't know if I can do this. Like, you're running straight into gunfire. And I don't, I don't remember what he said, but I remember them just shouting, like, third platoon, go, go, go. So I watched everybody go out and then just ran. And like they say time slows down, but it, it really it really does. Like you can feel every step that you're taking. You can see everything taking place in slow motion around you. I saw so many bodies and I saw so many Marines go down, but I never saw an insurgent. Like I never saw an insurgent alive with a gun. They, but they were ghosts. They blended in with this environment so perfectly. He's done. Hold on, I got one. Our mission was to clear the city of insurgents. It's, it's not right to use the term seek and destroy, but it was a full on frontal assault into the city of Fallujah. And you don't stop until everybody stops shooting. When you have 8,000 of them moving into a town like that with all their firepower, it's a terrifying uh, force. Just a massive killing machine. The <laughs> من يأذن المقرب بعد ما حد يطلع يعني القرية إحنا مالتنا حماماتنا تندلين يعني مو داخل خارج الصدقين يعني بس يأذن المقرب من نطلع برا للحمام نظل الصبح محصورين يعني تملنا تملنا ولا نومنا نوم ولا قعدتنا قعدة ولا أكلنا أكل يعني بأي لحظة خايفين قاعدين احنا واطفالنا وخايفين بأي لحظة يشيتون علينا. أنا ومصطفى 
بعد عقله ما يفتهم بعد صغير ما يفتهم مثلا اذا صار ضربه يجفي مثلا هو ماشي يجي علي يختل يمي يم امي ما يعرف شنو ها ها من كان بعد مو متصور هذا التاريخ انا باغي بذاكرتي اللي صوب بيه مصطفى وامه ايام رمضان بال بغتها مصطفى كان مريض مصطفى كان مريض مسخين انا شايله ضربته وجت في الجاي انا شايله اذن المغرب كان الناس كلها ملتمه اللي بالجامع واللي ببيتها دا تفطر وانا ما احس بس مصطفى هيك عني مصارينا بالتراب انا احس بنفسي ايدي مفتوحه وخاصرتي ما ملزومه طايره وملزومه بتجي الله ومصطفى ملقوح ومصارينا طالعه بالتراب ويصيح لي ماما ماكو احد انا الوحيده بالشارع أنا قاعد بالمسجد سمعت انفجار كلش غاوي طلعنا شفنا عالم تتراكل فشفت أنا ولد نازع القميص مالته نازعه وحاط طفل هيك شايله من باوعت أنا من بعيد عليه عرفتها مصطفى ابني الدكتور قال أنا ما أقدر أسوي المصطفى عملي مصطفى حالته خاطرة إلا هلا يوقعون قال الأم لا الأم أحسن الدكتور يجي يحكي وياي قال لازم أنت بقرفة مصطفى بقرفة أنا أقول لهم ما أقول لهم خيطة مصارينا يقولوا لي إيه هي ثارة مو بس مصارينا رجلة و... وجزء من خصوته وما وصار علينا قصف تن تن تنقل من قرفة القرفة الجام والبوب يقعن علينا اجوا يعني القوات الامريكيه والجيش العراقي كان وياهم دخلوا للمستشفى احنا طبعا كنا داخل المستشفى وما دخلوا للمستشفى كان ضرب بالمستشفى طلقات ما اعرف شنو فشافوا يعني حاله مصطفى كان مصطفى معلقيله دم كان يعني اول اربع ايام اصابته معلقيله دم مغذي وحالته تعبانه كلش تعبانه فقالوا انا ابغوا يمه انتم لا تطلعون بس بعد الاجراء يعني ما سوينا العمليات وهاي يعني هم انطوني نتيجه هم طمأنوني قالوا لي يعني يبغى هو رب العالمين احتمال يعني يعيش او احتمال يموت Ashley and I were in Fallujah 
with the Marines for several days. And we were getting shot at like every step of the way. Once you start getting shot at, it all changes. Once you start getting shot at and don't run for the hills, then you start building trust really quickly because they realize, and I heard this from multiple different military units, they think that the way we work as journalists is we have a template, an idea of what they're doing, and we are going out there to show how bad they are. But once you cross the wire with them, then they start saying, ah, okay, like, you're here to see how it really is. And I think that as the war dragged on, the Marines, they realized nobody gave a what they were doing in Iraq. So we would come out and actually tell stories, their stories. I mean, these guys were like in the thick of it, <laughs> terrified just like we were. We'd been trained for it. We have weapons to defend ourselves and body armor and you know that type of stuff. Those guys were just thrown right into it like, Go get them, you know, and go tell the story. Ashley and I just, it was so hard trying to file our stuff, you know, like I'm trying to write my story and Ashley is trying to file his pictures and I was always looking for electricity. And so I remember like the first day, I don't know what I was thinking, but I ran into the street because there was a car out there and, uh, you know, pulled the lid up and tried to put my little battery clips on the car battery. I, I don't want to think about that because there were snipers everywhere. I remember thinking like, this dude is insane. That is crazy. Like he's in the middle of, like so many guys have just been shot on this exact corner. The insurgents are everywhere. And Dex is out there trying to pull a car battery out of a burnt out car. Of course the battery doesn't work. Cause it's a bond burnt out car. <laughs> but like it, it was a classic Dexter. <laughs> like he will file no matter what. When I was 13 years old, I killed this deer at Centerville, Texas. And it was a real long shot, 17 steps, <laughs> 17 steps. Yeah. Why don't you go hunting anymore and fishing anymore like you used to? I don't know. It just doesn't do anything for me anymore. And after Billy died, I just lost a lot of uh, get up and go. This is a Corsican ram. Billy killed that one. And Billy killed this one here. Look here, Billy. Look at him again. <laughs> Billy. <laughs> Fallujah is this weird town. It looks like a movie set. And so there's these very defined borders. And then after those borders, it's just desert. And so we went from the top of the city all the way to the bottom, one end to the other. And we got to the, we got to the end and like the street ended and then the desert started. <laughs> Fallujah is the city of mosques. It's called the city of mosques. And the insurgents knew that. The Americans couldn't go into the mosque. So they would use them to stage and attack the Marines because they knew that they had more safety there than they did in a regular place. So this mosque, just short of the southern edge of Fallujah, a tank fired a shell through the minaret. And they apparently killed the insurgent who was inside. And I said, I've got to go and see that. I needed a photograph as evidence, as a reporter, to show that these mosques were being used as staging grounds. A picture of a dead insurgent inside a minaret showed that without question, these spaces were being violated and were therefore no longer protected by the Geneva Convention. So 
We went to the captain and said, hey man, can you please you know, radio everybody, tell them that we're gonna be running up the street to this mosque and just tell everyone not to shoot us. And this time Reed said, no, if you wanna go, this time you gotta go with the squad because it's too dangerous out there. And I said, no, I've got a policy against like this non-intervention policy where like stuff shouldn't happen on account of me. So the captain said, well, you can't go. And I said, well, I need the picture. And Dexter and I agreed to it, that we would go with the squad. I was chosen to lead a patrol along with my lieutenant out down to this minaret that was 400 meters away, maybe, that had this dead sniper in it. What did you think about doing this job? I was angry. I did not want to do it in the first place because we were pretty much done with the city. So for me, it was like, you know, that one last patrol thing, you know, I'm just like, I don't want to do this, you know, it's just so you could take a picture. You know, all right, if, if that's the job and that's the mission, then that's what I'll do, but I, I don't agree with this at all. I remember the moment I thought maybe this isn't a good idea. We were walking towards the minaret, and, you know, Fallujah had been so violent, so destructive, smoke and ruin everywhere, and we were walking in the minaret. For the first time in a week, it was quiet. There was nothing. And if you could picture, you kind of enter a compound. And the main mosque is kind of to your direct front and left. The minaret is to your direct front and right. And there's two groups of auxiliary buildings. So we clear out these auxiliary buildings. We clear out the mosque. And the last building left is the minaret. So we're going to go clear the minaret, see if we can get up and find this sniper, dead sniper. And when we got to the base of the minaret, Lance Corporal Billy Miller was stacked at the door. And he said, hey, Dominguez, come stack on me. Stack means get behind me and let's go up there together. Ashley Gilbertson was there. And with his Australian voice, he was trying to tell us, hey, you stay back. I'm just going to go run up there and take a quick picture. I wanted to get the picture and just leave, like get out of there as soon as we could so that nothing happened. Before we went there, a Marine stopped me and said, I, I've got to go ahead and clear it. So that was Lance Corporal William Miller. He went up first. He was followed by Christian Dominguez, and then me, and Dexter was apparently behind me. I didn't turn around to see. Itself, the minaret was scary. It was dark, the stairs were creaky, you know, the bricks were, it just seemed like the whole thing was gonna fall apart anyway. We're climbing and it's just the sound of rubble, like crunching concrete under our feet when we're climbing. There was a whole bunch of rubble on these stairs, and it was such a confined area. I mean, it wasn't much wider than this chair. And we're walking up there, and the steps were pretty big, and that Billy Miller was going up, and he was almost a full step ahead of me. And we kept tripping, and he almost said something. He almost said And just as you start to get a little bit of light through a hole in the wall from where the tank shell went through and killed this insurgent. And I'm thinking this is almost over, get my picture and get out. Then there was a gunshot, maybe multiple gunshots. and I felt water all over me. You know, immediately I thought, somebody released their rifle by accident and shot these camelbacks that they all wear. It's like these backpacks filled with water, like little backpacks filled with water. And then I heard Dominguez screaming.
we basically walked into this guy's muzzle. I saw a guy's hand laying down and he was laying down the stairs and we basically walked right into his gun. He shot Miller um, in the face and then Miller's body kind of turned and then he shot and at this point Miller kind of fell down and I was standing in f just below Miller and the shots, this guy was lighting up the wall, shooting relentlessly and the rocks were exploding in my face and it was so loud because of how confined the area was. And then I just remember like all of us starting to run down these stairs and I remember falling and just rolling. We rolled out of this minaret. And I looked down at my camera and my hands. And it wasn't water. It was blood and brain and... It was Billy, like just... all over me. Ashley was just like in a complete state of shock. Uh, he, I, I just remember him sitting there uh, kind of mumbling to himself. Uh, his helmet was on crooked and he was just saying, my fault, my fault, my fault, my fault, my fault. I couldn't breathe and Sam Williams was down there and he said, Dominguez, what happened? And out of some, I remember my hearing my voice was weird and saying, Miller's dead. And the look of confusion on his face, like, what? Everybody came running out of the building, except Billy. So obviously we were going back in to get him. I don't care about that picture or anything at this point. We've got to get Billy out of here. We've got to get our wounded out of here. And it was a relentless effort to go up there and retrieve Miller's body and take out the threat that was up there. They tried to go up there a couple times. Um, and on like the second or third time, they were able to go up there and get his body out. They dragged Billy out. They put him onto a stretcher. And I remember thinking, don't look. You can't look. He said, you know, please, please tell me he's not dead. Please tell me, please tell me, please tell me he's not dead. I mean, so it, it fell to me to tell him that, that he was. I had stashed Dexter and Ashley in the mosque because it was the most secure building. I tell the Lieutenant, okay, we're getting out of here. The mission's over, we're going home. I've got Billy's weapon in my hand and my weapon is slung. So I come around the corner into the mosque and I was like, you're gonna take this and hold it. And I said, and when I count to three, you and you are gonna run out this door and stay right behind me. And we ran down this street back to the firm base. The second we started running, the machine gun opened fire from insurgents behind us. And at that point, it felt like we were surrounded. There were shots coming from everywhere. We, we had been there for a little bit too long. And I remember our tactics not living up to what they should have been at that moment. And we kind of lost a little bit of discipline. And we made it back to the base. Nobody else was shot. Sam told us that this is what happens in war, that it wasn't our fault. We went to the lieutenant. I said, well, I'm sorry, it's my fault, I know. And he said, yeah, it's your fault. <laughs> and then I called my editor and said, I have to get out of here. <laughs> Bye.
بيش طلبة بالعصو زين بس ضربك انت لا انا ماما انا كنت بغتها يعني كرهت اللغات الامريكيه الجاي قلت هم هذول يعني السبب اللي صار بمصطفى ابني وبزوجتي يعني كان هم سبب اوكي سو كان يو اسك مصطفى تو واتش مي اوكي طلع على شانه بس بعد ما طلعت لامريكا يعني من طلعت لامريكا وشفت هناك يعني شلون ساعدوا مصطفى فاللي انا شفته شفت تصرفهم الصحيح يعني حبيتهم هناك <تصفيق> أم صاحة كلي فوق اللازم يعني كل واحد عنده إيمان بالحياة فهو هذا الشيء اللي يعطيني القوة أنا أمن برب العالمين وبالحياة private graveside service happening now with the closest of family as they bid their final farewell to their patriarch, President George H. W. Bush. And now... Let future generations understand the burden and the blessings of freedom. It means that all the people in this country that don't understand what the men and women are dying for, they need to understand it. My son was one of the ones who didn't come back. But in some ways, he's better off because he doesn't have to live with the guilt that so many of them are living with because they did come back and their buddies didn't. I know that Ashley has a lot of guilt, but he was doing what he was supposed to do and Billy was doing his job. He loved being a Marine. He really, really did. I waited so long. I was so scared to call the Miller family. I, I thought that they would be understandably really angry with me. So eventually I called and saw them. Lewis and Susie were absolutely beautiful, like amazing people. I mean, I still love talking to Susie, emailing with her, calling her. And I wish it was easier than it is, but I feel like I owe her, her son. At the time, we took over the city, and we did what our mission told us to do. On paper, it's a success. For me, it's difficult, because I hold on to my friends, and the ones that were killed in our memories. And you look at back at the instability of what's going on in Fallujah. I'll take my friends back.
يعني قلنا احنا يلا يلا خلصنا من الامريكان انه بجانا داعش اثرت هواي علينا اثرت على حياتنا رجعتنا لي ورا الناس الناس اللي ترجع تقدم احنا العراق نرجع لي ورا يا اللوجة حسب يعني من اهلنا قبل يسولفون من كانوا يعني هم شباب شيء كل جميل بس الان انا من وعيت عليها شيء خرابه يعني هيك شيء مدمر انا اقول يعني اي واحد يسمعني او يعني انا يعني اي واحد يسمع انا منيتي يعني يبتعد عن عن الحروب او اي شيء هاي ومنيتي يعني العالم كله ما يصيب اي شيء this and other Frontline programs, visit our website at pbs.org slash frontline. Frontline's Once Upon a Time in Iraq, Fallujah, is available on Amazon Prime Video.